revolution. I know it's taking over. Revolution. That's why I'm telling everybody worldwide. This is my world. Revolution. Get ready, get ready for the Theo Chelly effect. I'm a big fan of the show. Chuck O'Chelly, and he's been known for many years as a blind GFK researcher specializing in intelligence agency involvement in multiple assassination, propaganda, and other global criminal operations in the 20th and 21st centuries. Your listeners are extremely fortunate to have you, and everybody at AFR I know loves you, man. We should learn from our relatively recent history, my brother. That's where I'm coming from. I say I'll bow to the bishop. And now, and now the, most, the most underrated voice in all, in all media. The Alternatives Alternative, Chuck O'Chelly. And it is the 18th day of November 2016, allegedly according to that thing we call a calendar. This is the O'Chelly Effect. And, of course, it is broadcast live from the facilities of American Freedom Radio at AmericanFreedomRadio.com. Bottom line is my broadcast location is in an undisclosed place, but you never know what might come next. Anyway, we have changed up the subject matter this week quite a bit. Of course, I am exhausted from discussing the 2016 election, or should I say selection process. I am completely frustrated with my (laughs) alleged colleagues. That's for sure in the, once again, I use the word alleged, alleged alternative media. But you know what? Tonight we're not going to discuss that. Let's talk about the planet. How about that one, folks? You know, we are all occupying this particular same rock. Yeah, I know I'm paraphrasing uh, John F. Kennedy uh, just a little bit. Yes, we all breathe the same air. We all care about our children's futures, all of that. Those wonderful sentiments. Of course, they had to put a bullet in this guy's head because he was telling you the truth. So one day, if somebody decides to open up the back of my head, you know why. Anyway. Back to the planet, which will be here long after I'm gone, I'm sure, and hopefully we won't destroy it all. My guest tonight is Jim Lee. Now, Jim has not been on the show before, but I assure you many, many people do know about him. If you don't, you need to go to climateviewer.org. Now, I'm going to read just a bit from the About page on climateviewer.org. Uh, actually, I had to copy and paste it into a document because you know how blind I am. I can barely see anything. i got to blow up his website and everybody else's when I look at it. But, hey, there we are. Um, the bottom line here is this is about the website, and we will get to know Jim just a little bit, too, tonight, I assure you. Okay. So it starts out by telling you uh, that Climate Viewer features real-time atmospheric and geophysical monitoring with maps covering geoengineering, weather modification, climate change, pollution, privacy, exploration, migration, geosciences, architecture, green energy solutions, sunken ships, airplane crash sites, and more. Sounds like there is a lot, but literally this is a very cool thing. If you go to climateviewer.com or excuse me, climateviewer.org, if you go to climateviewer.org and you take a look at the interesting map of the planet, you can watch storms, you can watch all kinds of things in real time. Of course, it also says on the about page that it is crowdsourced. It is open source mapping on steroids. Okay, so discover how natural and artificial phenomena from past to present, underground to outer space, might affect the quality and length of our lives. Form teams to improve life on Earth. Well, that almost sounds like a mission statement along with a rather, rather uh, extremely inclusive (laughs) group of things to observe, to monitor and to. Well, pay attention to. Anyway, Jim Lee's a brilliant guy. I've talked to him before, and I scheduled an interview with him, you know, uh, uh, a few months ago. And uh, for a personal reason, not because I don't like Jim and not because he doesn't like me, for a personal reason, he couldn't make it. But tonight he's here, and I'm extremely glad. How you doing tonight, Jim? Uh, better never want to fight about it. 
<laughs> we could. We could. Hey, you you want to start a fight? We could we could fight, Jim. It's not a problem. Here we go. Ready? Uh let's see. What's the most divisive thing I can think of in the past couple of weeks? You, are are you are you happy with the trumping of America? Are you happy with that, Jim? You know it. <laughs> okay. So we can start fighting because I feel everybody's been had once again. Um but Let's not do that, Jim, please. I'm okay, not, well, really I, because, because I can't help myself, and I love to fight. Fighting is the spice of life. I will counter that with the reason I'm happy solely is that in the Colin Powell email that was leaked, it says, the Bo- I just got back from the Bohemian Grove, and the Grove attendees agreed that we are voting for Hillary. Mm. I understand. I really do. But the people that attend the Bohemian Grove are not the entirety of the elite. I think I, I that, fully uh, agree with that as well. I know there are lots of rings of disgusting people who think they're better than everybody else. But just that statement alone was enough for me to go. If the if the New World Order wants her, I'm with him. I, I understand, but one section of the New World Order fighting with the other, I think, is actually what resulted from this guy being chosen. She was yeah. so despicable. I think that's more accurate. I agree. You know, she was so despicable. I mean, I, I think it would have been extremely difficult to even even to the dumbed down people out there to believe that she was the victor, <laughs> you know, because literally before the before it, and here I go doing it anyway, even though I said I wouldn't. Before the selection, and I do call it a selection, before the selection, uh, I couldn't even find a enthusiastic supporter of, you know, Shillery. I couldn't find it. I couldn't find, yeah, you know, the Wall exist. Street. They, they don't. don't exist. I, I could find Trump supporters. Now, they, they had, you know, weird ideas about certain things, and they were only cherry-picking parts of what he was saying. And, of course, Jonestown supports him, and a lot of people have decided to say that, you know, there is an absolute way that this guy is the uh, the answer to the system. And I see him as part of the system. And you know what? I, I really felt the next day I said, wow, gee, big headline, a rich white man is back in the White House. Not a shocker, generally speaking, <laughs> but... Uh, okay. Anyway, that's not the thrust of tonight's discussion, though. But it was um, fun. It was fun, though. So let's get back to it. Yeah. So, <laughs> la- so just to tie that to the, what we were just talking about, back to the map um, on climateviewer.org, I'm thinking about mapping out all of these uh, triggered riots that are going on right now from the media propaganda and the dehumanization of an individual into a puppet. Um, you know, these triggered individuals are on the march and, you know, it's, it's like, it's a different kind of Occupy Wall Street. It's like Occupy insanity. So maybe I'll map them out and record, you know, and put it on Climate Viewer just for like posterity's sake, because come next election, I want to remind everybody of the lunacy that followed because, you know, they made it, they broke it, they bought it. You know, you're right about that. And also, let's not forget that, of course, now let's qualify a few things with you, Jim, because, again, there might be people who have never heard of you before at all. That's right. And and I want to get into this because there there's sort of a divide among the alleged alternative media. Once again, there are people out there that are starting to say that chemtrails are not real. That uh, that this is you know just a uh, a made up conspiracy theory stuff like this. Um, I would argue that <clears throat> if you really understood the patterns of what was being sprayed over our heads. Now this is me speaking. Uh, you know that I guarantee you that where you see the greatest levels of agitation in the public, uh, they might there might very well be a serious correlation. Okay, you know, you take a look at the way that they allow other chemicals and other heavy metals to uh, be prolific in an area. Like, for instance, in the inner cities, I mean, there's plenty of lead in the water. Lead does lead directly to hostility. I think that in combination with a lot of electromagnetic fields, you know, hey, metal and magnets, these things kind of come together, you know, as we talked about with Larry Woods the other night. Yeah. Um, the fact is that I think you could find a correlation with that. So, but, but let's, let's first get a handle on you. Um, 
you're not one of these guys who doesn't believe in chemtrails per se, although maybe, I don't know, do you object to that term? No, I, I, I'm actually quite fond of the term now. I think it's kind of funny. Um, chemtrails are a thing if you believe chemtrails are a thing. It is uh, something I like to call slave speak. And slave speak is any word that you have to give your power to it. You have you have to willingly choose that I believe this is a real thing. And usually the person, the slave speaker, the person who's made up this word, they gain power over you because generally speaking, if I call it a Tesla tech array and I'm the only person on the planet who's ever called it a Tesla tech array, then you'll have to worship me. Because I'm the only person who knows this stuff and I, you have to come to my altar and I will divine the truth to you. And the fact that people can't see these mechanisms of, you know, control, even in the activist community, everybody does it. They, they make up their own jargon and then people buy into it. And now they worship these individuals who've made up jargon for them to worship. Chemtrails is just like that. So chemtrails are contrails are persistent contrails are artificial clouds are aviation induced cloudiness aviation induced cirrus cirrus induced cloudiness i could go on for an hour and the reason i'm saying this is because if you go to google scholar scholar scholar.google.com and you type in all of those terms i just gave you they are all referring to clouds behind planes planes made clouds Clouds called chemtrails, clouds called contrails, clouds called persistent contrails. At the end of the day, this is mind control, perception management, you know, propaganda. It's how you, how you make a person believe what you want them to believe about a thing by the word you choose. So chemtrails, in a sense, is a grand mind control mechanism. If you believe the word means it gives you more gallons, that's what it is. If you believe it's a mind control weapon of nanoparticular bots that are going to infest your brain, that's a real thing now. And it can manifest in your body and your body can manifest from fear. It can destroy itself. So Mm. these people who know this, they use it as a weapon. They use it as a distraction, as a straw man. So the chemtrail debate is a great example of it because there are the people, there are lots of people who profit from the spreading of propaganda about it. And, you know, there are others who won't even use that word and choose to use other words to describe it. And all of these guys have one thing in common. They're just talking about clouds made by planes. So to defeat slave speak, you have to go to the lowest common denominator. Um, You can read about slave speak on my other website. It's climateviewer.com slash propaganda climateviewer.com slash propaganda or on any single article on the website i've got slave speak linked on the sidebar you'll see a picture of a guy shooting himself in the head and he's got a tv head um but the the the, the idea behind slave speak is simple if i say to you chuck do you know what an apple is you would say yes of course i would say uh yeah it's a fruit i know it's this color i know it's about this size i yeah. i have a whole definition that goes along with it and i say absolutely i know what an apple is okay and and in a court of law or in a public ring nobody's going to argue with you that that's an apple so that's a low level descriptor it is the lowest common denominator it is not calling it a fancy venetian red juicy thing you know i mean don't it's the simplest term to describe the object and the the least amount of people would argue about it that's called a low level descriptor right high level descriptors are things like god government good evil truth lie mm. these and words the- yeah, the reason why I was just going to say the reason for this, and of course I've read some of your stuff on slave speak, and I would love to do a show devoted solely to that topic because I think it is uh, essential for people to understand. And to tell you the truth, I fall into the traps of these things all the time myself, and I'm doing my best to uh, to simplify information. And I really need to consider this stuff a lot more often when I speak. I know that. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I'm trying to correct it, but what's interesting about the list of words you just gave 
is that there are so many subjective possibilities, right? To right. how one might define them. Uh, we'll take, we'll take one of the most fun examples. Okay. Jim, God. Yeah. Now, God to somebody listening to me may very well be the Trinity of what? The Holy Spirit, uh, you know, Jesus mm-hmm. Christ and, you know, and, and so on and so forth. Now, God might be to someone else. Something entirely different. God might actually be a plurality, uh, which is, you know, another possibility. I mean, it really depends on who you're speaking to. So it's kind of an open term that is subject to many different interpretations, right? Yeah. And at the same time, it is completely and utterly possible that every single one of those people is right. And that's the amazing part. The amazing part is that if perception is reality, and that if you believe a thing, you can make reality change because we know this to be true. You can physically alter your body simply by thinking things. And that the secret, if anybody's ever heard of that, <laughs> is true. What you put out does come back. You create your universe in front of you. I learned this a couple of years ago. It has changed my life. Um, you know, the power of visualizing what you want instead of what you don't want. Mm. So that if we know all of these things that as especially as activist leaders, because I try to focus only on leaders. Like I'm, I mean, I'm not trying to sound above the fray, but I try to teach the teachers because it, I can benefit more people by teaching them these tools. And for the first three years of climateviewer.com, you'll notice that I barely did. I didn't do any FaceTime. I really didn't do any radio. I was making connections with other people saying, you've got to use this material because I'm, you know, I don't want to be the public face of this stuff. I'm, I try it. When I first started, I was resonated. I was anonymous and nobody knew me and many people tried to dox me. They all failed. And after, you know, two years on resonated.com and resonated.net, I decided to tell everybody who I was because I felt that my mission in trying to tell the truth was hampered by the fact that I was an anonymous individual. Does that make sense? Well, I got to tell you that uh, th- this draws an interesting parallel between you and I uh, because Honestly, I worked uh, on, in, on political assassinations and uh, uh, investigation, interviews, things like this. I turned over most of my work to others so that it could be refined better. In fact, I tried to advise other people doing shows like this long mm-hmm. before I ever stepped to a microphone. Uh, look, here is where you're being suckered into propaganda. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here is where you're misunderstanding the evidence. I tried to advise them and refine their ability so that we could actually have a coherent uh, revisionist history appear to the public, right? Um, and it sounds very strange. I worked on that case for, you know, something like uh, almost 20 years before I ever came forward and attached my name to a single thing. Yeah. Um, and I was an anonymous source, an anonymous interviewer, an anonymous helper uh, all the time. And, you know, look, it's not about the money. It was about getting about out the, the truth, information. About doing it for the right reasons, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I understand exactly where you're coming from, but at some point what happened was, and the reason why I put my name on the show, it's not a matter of ego. It's not a matter of I want my name to be known, but it's a matter of I I thought that it was exactly the right time to no longer hide. I I felt as though I was hiding at a certain point. Uh, That's exactly where I went to is that if I'm going to sit here and and be on YouTube and try to be a leader, not a follower, because that's what you're choosing to do, whether you like it or not. When you when you step up, you're you're pulling a Donald Trump. You're going to take the abuse. So if you're going to be a leader, how can I go out and tell you all to be not afraid and to act on the things I'm telling you about that? We can defeat these things that we can stop geoengineering. We could stop that. I know how. Um, but how can I tell you to do that if I'm too afraid to tell you who I am? Because I'm scared somebody's going to come get me. Well, see, exactly my attitude. Now, I find it interesting that you've changed to the term geoengineering here because I've had people scold me for utilizing one term over the other. And I think they're both quite applicable because uh, the, the, the thing that I call chemtrails 
Okay. Uh, and the thing that I call geoengineering are not mutually exclusive or mutually, uh, uh exclusive. Okay. You can geoengineer while spraying other chemicals that do other things that don't do things to the planet, but maybe do things to the organisms on them. I think that these can be simultaneous and also separate agendas Correct. in the presentation of these false yeah. clouds. So I won't take that correction. I mean, um, I'll bring up a name. A guy like Dane Wigington did not want to come on my show, and I now don't uh, – don't necessarily know what to do with some of the information. Some of the information Dane's put out is is very good, okay. But I agree uh, with that. but I see that he is married to a particular, well, a particular class of what you would absolutely describe as slave speak, and uh, and and I don't think it's entirely healthy. Now that doesn't mean that I discount all of his work, but I tell everyone at all times to reconsider the logic the sense and the evidence at all times, no matter who is speaking. I don't care if it's me, if it's the people I bring on this show, if it's people that hate my guts, whatever it is, I don't care. The fact is you should always take it and critically examine it for yourself to make sure that it's something that is viable as information. And I don't care if it's, you know, today's news story or if it's a scientific, uh, uh, you know, foothold that one has regarding their view on these things. Uh, I think it's relevant to continuously re-examine your positions. Okay. And, um, but the thing is, over the years, a few times, I've had people very, very upset with me for using either term. Chemtrails, you shouldn't say that. Geoengineering, you I shouldn't know. say that. I know. Um, and, I've, and had, I I've think, heard it all. You know, go ahead. So, so, so the thing is, um, you know, and I'm going to be real honest about this, like that Dane Wigington and I, at, at the time, you know, when I first met him was around like 2013 and we just previously, I just previously mentioned, I started out as resonated and I had resonated.com and .net and uh resonated.net was like a blog and resonated.com was where I made my first version of the map that is on climateviewer.org. And back then it was called the radiation database. Mm -hmm. If you look in the world of geoengineering and I want everybody to hear this because it's the truth. If you go anywhere on the Internet and you look at geoengineering research or weather modification research, you're going to see resonated.com on an image on one of the articles, <laughs> guaranteed, because they're everywhere. Um, that was me. And then after I became Jim Lee, I changed it to terraformingincorporated.com. So it was terraformingink.com. And... uh I thought it was witty. It's about geoengineering. That's what I'm mapping out over here and people that modify the weather. So people who terraform our planet, terraforming incorporated. That's my new website. You can go look it up on archive.org. Um, mm -hmm. and when I changed it to terraforming incorporated, I had put a, a list of geoengineering patents up there. I had put, um, you know, a whole bunch of different pages, a list of every weather modification company links to their websites and how to call them and how the U.S. military were members of the Weather Modification Association. I put it all up there. I did this back in 2012. Um, and Dane saw my, my geoengineering timeline and he shared it. You can even go and search geoengineeringwatch.org and Jim Lee. And you'll see that, you know, back then he shared it and we were kind of hitting it off okay. Um, and I don't know where, where things went wrong, but, uh, Dane was supposed to talk with Mick West and, you know, John Masaria, this fellow I know, um, had set up an interview and I had to fill in and me and Dane butted heads over the word geoengineering. This is the only reason I'm telling you this story mm. because back then, I had it in my head that it was harmful for him to use the word geoengineering because it shielded the other people. And in the end, my big headedness really just tore our relationship apart right from the get go because I was an egomaniac and I can, I can admit that in front of all these people. Um, and I thought I knew better than him <laughs> because in my book, I had been debating Ken Caldera and David Keith and the real geoengineers in Ken Caldera's forum since 2012. So this had been like a year and a half where, you know, I had 
I had put up the congressional hearings where Ken Caldera testified in front of Congress trying to get funding for geoengineering research. Most people don't know this stuff. I'm just going to tell you the whole story. Mm. And I put the videos. I'd found them somewhere on archive.org. I dug the videos up, converted them to a format that I could upload to YouTube and put them up. And some geoengineering scientist was like, holy crap, you know, why have why has this never been posted to the list? They had posted the video to there. And basically what it turned out happened was Ken Caldera never told half the scientists in his forum that he had testified in front of Congress. And I'd outed him and they were all like, why were why were we not notified of this? And then the next post down is like this Jim Lee guy. He looks like he's going to be trouble. He's got a big site. <laughs> and somebody on Twitter tweeted me. It was like, holy crap, the geoengineers are talking about you. And they sent me a link. I had never heard of any of this stuff. You know, I just uploaded some videos to YouTube and then clicked the link and I read it. And I was like, holy crap, <laughs> you know, um, and I got invited to the list. Now, only there's really only scientists on that list and policymakers. You know what I mean? This is not a, a forum that they let anybody speak in. Um, and they let me in and, uh, I said, thank you. And I just hope that you guys will allow me to ask some questions. You know, I try to be as respectful as possible. So I made this post about how, what they were doing was circumventing weather modification laws by rebranding weather modification geoengineering. And it got the most second most views of any post on his forum to date. Um, after they kicked me off and banned me from his forum, uh, in 2014, 15, when they banned me, they went back to that post and they removed my post because it, <laughs> because the legal argument I made in that post is sound. It will, if anybody ever made that argument in court, they'd be busted and they'd have to see all of this differently. But they deleted the post, but the problem is all the replies are still there. So you could still see my post in some of the replies, but it just shows how butthurt they are by the very first post where I said, look, if cloud seeding has not been able to prove its efficacy in 60 years, the National Academy of Science, the, you know, the this, the that, the this, the that, all these reports say that you guys say you're going to do this and you predict that you'll get this much more rain. And at the end of the day, they go, God could have made that rain. We have no way to prove what you're doing is doing anything. It's completely random to this day, completely random every time they do it. So, if that's the case with cloud seeding, how do you guys think that you're going to be able to test and deploy aerosols worldwide that's going to modify rain worldwide and this ain't weather modification? Well, you, Jim, you're, you're kind of stupid and you're just a little person. So we're going to tell you that climate and weather are different, Jim. Come calm down, Jim. We're talking about modifying climate, not weather. And I'm going. So you're planning on modifying the long term. Well, let which me ask will a, modify the weather. Yeah, let me ask a dumb question though. Uh, you know, ho- hopefully I don't sound too stupid, but if you modify the weather, wouldn't that affect the climate? And also, if you have uh, effectively modified the climate, wouldn't that affect the weather? Yes. I mean, both ways. I, if you I, if you read the papers by Ben Kravitz. Write it down, Ben Kravitz, and he'll tell you all about how putting sulfate aerosols and titanium dioxide, diamond dust, all the stuff they've talked about, any of that, if it's done in the northern hemisphere, will dry up the southern hemisphere. So because you put down aerosols very thick up here, it's going to affect rainfall down here, the natural analog, meaning Naturally, we see this occur when volcanoes go off. We had a very big volcano in 2008, made the Amazon basin damn near dry up. So if these guys want to do this, they know it's going to affect rainfall worldwide, but they don't want to call it weather modification because they're just modifying temperature, which is a scam. They've, they've admitted that what they're doing will modify weather, but they're calling it geoengineering, climate inter- engineering, climate intervention. That's a scam. So what they're actually doing is 
they're saying they're going to modify the temperature over a long scale, but in fact, they're going to be controlling the rain worldwide. Once they do this, they will have global control over rainfall. And you can go to Ken Caldera's geoengineering group. It's a Google group. And you can read the, the, the post. The article is called Geoengineering, How to Deal with the Losers. If you go to climateviewer.com slash geoengineering, right there in like the first article, you're going to see geoengineering will kill people. And I link to that post. And in that post, they basically say exactly what I just told you. Look, geoengineering is going to dry out portions of the planet. There may never be rain there ever again. And how are we going to pay the dead people? So right now, the legal geoengineering that's going on at the UN, the Paris Climate Agreement, guys who are trying to profit from that and get geoengineering fully funded and legal, um, that's their goal. Their goal is, I just had a brain fart because I just pictured Ken Caldera and I almost puked in my head. Um, <laughs> so, so, so that, you know, at the end of the day, that's their goal. Their goal is to get funding for this stuff so that they can deploy it on a worldwide scale and it be legal. And they have a mechanism for paying the dead people so that nobody goes to jail. Um, and the funny thing about all this is that Ken Caldera and David Keith and all these guys, they, they first really met and had this big push for this crap. It's something called a Silamar. And a, it's a, a Silamar. I know I'm Southern. I don't want to butcher this. And at that conference, they basically said that if, you know, if, if people come to see geoengineering as a plan cooked up by rich Anglo Saxons to dominate the climate, then they will all surely be tarred and feathered. That's a quote. And I, so I, when I got booted, from his forum, I told Ken because of something he said about trying to reframe the whole discussion. They did a public poll. Public poll said people hate this idea. It's dangerous. We should never do it. And then Ken comes in there co- talking about, um, well, you know, I just think that the questions were framed improperly. I mean, if we frame them in this way, then I think that we would have got a better response. And I said to Ken, Ken, what you're doing is mind control. If you have to ask the question a different way to get a better result for what you're doing, then you're intentionally being fake, being disingenuous, and you're being dangerous. You keep this up, and I'll be here with my homeboys and Anonymous, and we'll bring the tar and feathers. And when he heard tar and feathers, (laughs) he knows because he's seen the pictures on my website where I've got that quote of the tar and feathers from Miss Illamar, and he knows they had a – they had a mutual conniption, and uh, he kicked me out of the group because he knows exactly why I said it and what he's doing is wrong. So at the end of the day, these guys, they want this at any cost. Why? Because Bill Gates is funding Ken Calder and David Keith. He has a thing called Pfizer, F-I-C-E-R. And Pfizer is the fund for innovative climate energy research, something like that. But Bill Gates puts money in this little coffer. David Keith and Ken Caldera are the people who divvy that money out. So people come to Ken and David and they say, hey, I got this great research project. You know, we'll look at using commercial aviation and we're going to use lasers to shoot the chemtrails because then the ice will get smaller. And if they're smaller crystals, then they'll stay aloft longer and they'll block more long wave radiation and blah, blah, blah. Can we study that, Ken? Can we study that, David? Can we get some of Bill Gates money to study this idea? And then they decide yes or no. And that's how it's all going right now. So Bill Gates funds a lot of it. The National Science Foundation funds a lot of it. You can see all of who's paying for it, who's doing it on climateviewer.com slash geoengineering. Um, wow. but that's the, that's the legal realm of geoengineering. Well, now, that's Ken, not only, well, hang on a second, cause that's definitely. not only the legal realm. Okay. But to me, here's, here's again, I'm um, maybe I'm oversimplifying. Please tell me when I am, Jim. Okay. But the fact is that by screwing with weather, okay, you're going to alter what is grown in various areas on the planet, okay, which means that you're interrupting the food chain. And 
it seems to me as though scientists, although they always claim to be able to predict things, usually have to go back and readjust from their earlier predictions in general because this is not fully understood, the entirety of the ramifications of doing this kind of crap. I mean, let's just assume. You're right. You, you, you're, you're, hit, you're hitting the nail on the head. You're more right than you know. Okay. Be, be, because here, here's the thing that, that, that frightens me. All right. And well, not really frightens me, but concerns me. How about that? I don't, I don't believe in fear. I use that word. I shouldn't. Here's the thing that concerns me. Okay. Let's just say that this was for a benevolent reason, Jim. Let's just say that, uh, that all of this is completely benevolent. There is nothing nefarious connected to it whatsoever in the minds of the individuals doing it. I think that the old axiom of they know not what they do applies here because look, Let's just say they cause too much of a certain thing to grow because they poured a bunch of rain on an area that doesn't normally get it. Okay. Now that provides a food supply for an animal. Okay. As crazy as this, I mean, again, stop me where you think I'm just way off in left field, but you have an animal there and, and it could be any animal that eats that plant. Now that animal grows to a larger population. That animal, in fact, is a food source for another animal. I know I'm oversimplifying here, but it seems to me as though these things are fully possible. Uh, another animal now becomes a menace to some other species and could wipe out. I mean, they could literally cause the extinction of species of, you know, and it could be almost nothing. It could be tree frogs in a particular area that, uh, that are overrunning something, right? It could be, uh, it, it, it could be a bug population that is now uh, completely overflowing into other areas and now beginning to affect, uh, parts geographically that they never did reach before. And therefore it changes again the balance in a whole other place. And these things could, like dominoes, fall all over, say, an entire continent. And meanwhile, these are not even the intended uh, results that people have for this, they decided they wanted to change the temperature, but what they did was That's right. they, they caused rain to be snow or snow to be rain, or they caused no rain in a place that needed it, or they caused too much in a place that doesn't usually get a lot, and it That's goes right. all over the place, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address everything you just said. <laughs> okay. So first of all, about understanding the system. Um, this is the most important thing that I try to, to get across to people. Cloud aerosol interaction is the greatest unknown in climate science. Mm. Cloud aerosol interaction is what we're talking about with chemtrails, is what we're talking about with contrails, is what we're talking about with making clouds all over the planet. Cloud aerosol interaction. How do aerosols turn into clouds, and what do the aerosols and the clouds do to the climate? So in order to you know come up with all these dire predictions of the future, these are computer models. Now, here's another thing you don't know about old Jimbo. I, before I started Resonated.com, before all of this, um, was a computer graphics artist, and I used 3D Studio Max and Lightwave 3D. I worked for a company called Positron. I actually did some stuff in, like, Industrial Light and Magic. I did a frog, a texture map thing. woo <laughs> I was featured in a CG magazine. You know, I got lucky. Um, but I taught myself all this 3D stuff um, because I made video games and I made maps for Rainbow Six, Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six. And um, I modeled them in 3D and I made like a I turned Rainbow Six into a space station. We had lasers and we had the gun from aliens and, you know, all that stuff. There were aliens to shoot at, you know, and it was a, a mod called the Renegade Legion Total Conversion Mod. It was the biggest mod for the. The game and the guys, the developers at uh, Red Storm actually invited me up there and offered me a job and I ended up declining it because of my father's health. And I just never went back to it. <laughs> Go figure. You know, like I, 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 I had to make a choice and I read about the life of a video game designer and how they work them like, you know, slaves and they say, you know, you better get to work and work 90 hours because there's 20 college students that want your job. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, it sounds all glorious. And then you re, you know, I started really looking at it and I said, you know, I love doing this, but I don't think I'd ever want to do it as a job. So like, I just 
let it go. But my point is this. While doing all that 3D manipulation and learning about programming and how numbers and computers work, it's interesting because the thing that ties what I just talked about with the gaming to this geoengineering world is that, in a sense, gamers and game designers are trying to mimic nature. And every year they refine it. We all see it. If you're a gamer, you know exactly what I'm talking about because the new Xbox One version of Skyrim is dope. When you add the shader effects in and you add the volumetric lighting and you add all of that funky, cool stuff that makes it look more like Lord of the Rings the movie than Lord of the Rings the video game, that's where we're, what we're talking about. So same thing's true with these geoengineering, global warming alarmists. They have computer models. Right. They take measurements, they use instruments, and they spit out predictions in front of lobbyists. So this is my whole take on, you know, how this works. Um, you know, once they start modeling everything, they think that they know, and then they go and they revise, and then they go, well, we, well, what are we supposed to do, just not guess at all? I mean, we have to start somewhere. And then they admit their own certainties in ranges. So they say this has like a 20% uncertainty or, you know, <laughs> some of them are just really blatant. They say the, the, our confidence on this information is extremely low. <laughs> you know, <laughs> when they're, ta- when they're, when they're talking about chemtrails and contrails, you'll see that it says linear contrails. And it's got this little bitty tick. And this is on the IPCC joke paper. It's got this little bitty tick. And then it says, Cirrus clouds, and there's this huge line. It's bigger than any other line on the chart. And then you realize that the problem with people in the chemtrail world is they're so stuck on words and that once a contrail, as they like to call them, once it's linear, it's a line, once it sticks around and it turns into the fanned out version, that's called a cirrus cloud. Whether you like it or not, that's what it's called. And the reason why they're not accounted for at the IPCC, the reason why the geoengineering morons don't want to talk about it is because in the science world, in the, you know, geoengineering, global warming, we're trying to model the world and tell you what does what. They cannot tell once a, once it fans out into a cirrus cloud, they cannot say that cirrus cloud was made by a plane or if that cirrus cloud was made naturally. And I know that that's a big cop out for them. And I think it's disgusting, but you know, at the end of the day, they're working with the crappy sensors they have. And the reason I know all of this intimately is because on climateviewer.org slash 3d where my map is, I have put every single instrument they got on there. I actually nerded out for like a year and a half while it was still resonated.com and went and found them all. Like the baseline surface radiation network. There's only like seven of those sensors worldwide. How you got a network only got seven sensors? Um, you know, I went, you know, aerosol robotic network, you know, all the wind profile radars and, you know, everything, you know, sounding, um, Anyway, drop signs, you name it. Digison, I got it. Ionospheric heaters, all of them. Um, you know, I, I mapped it out before anybody did. And 90% of the crap you read online came from me. You know, when it, when it relates to harp or geoengineering, it came from me. They stole it. Dane Wigington included. Um, he took my patent list. He did not credit me. It's still up there today. You can compare my patent list to his patent list. He stole it. He didn't credit me. And I've heard that from a lot of people, but I'm not going to hold ill will against the guy. He's still getting the truth out there. So that's why I haven't made a big fuss about it. I could go do something about it, but you know, whatever. But that's the, that's the way it's been all along. You know, I put my stuff out there so that it would at least rise to the surface and people would know the truth. So that's right. why I just chalk that up to that. But, um, with, with this, with these, these sensors, I've looked at all of them with the, with the, their predictions. I've seen it. And I know what kind of data went into it because I'm looking at every sensor you got. And I'm telling you, you're severely lacking. And the fact that they don't account for aerosols properly, the fact that they don't account for planes making clouds that turn into cirrus clouds and they have no clue what the clouds do, you can go to climateviewer.com right now. And there's an article on the front page. 
You'll have to scroll down a little bit, but it says CERN Cloud Conundrum. CERN, like CERN the big collider, Cloud Conundrum. And this is an article by Judith Curry. And I've got a portion of it there. Please click the link and finish reading it because she's brilliant and she nailed it. They basically said Earth is not warming as quickly as they initially thought because CERN made a cloud with only a little bit of water vapor, some carbon black dust, and some galactic cosmic rays in a tube. Mm. And the reason why that is seriously important is because up to this point it has always been assumed that sulfuric acid plays a role in cloud formation now in plain sulfuric acid changes the amount of aerosols coming out of the plane and is a regulator of cloud production in jets so sulfur and carbon black dust is what you make chemtrails with is what you make persistent contrails with choose the word you like we all know i'm talking about clouds coming out of planes i call them artificial clouds it's the right. simplest term. That's my, that's my done deal. I'm, si- I'm signed, sealed, delivered. These are artificial clouds. They're clouds created artificially by man-made sources. Mm. You cannot argue with it. It is the lowest level descriptor that I personally can use. So if I'm on an, uh, on an interview with someone like Madison Star Moon, she calls them chemtrails. I'm going to call them chemtrails. When I called Dr. Rangsai Halthori from the Aviation Climate Change Research Initiative at the FAA, and the guy's got a Ph.D., and he runs a massive um, organization that is currently testing chemtrails, you know what I call them? Contrails. The reason why, if you want somebody to not discount the validity of the things you're saying, you've got to be careful in the words you choose simply because people have these mental walls and, you know, these Ivy leaguers, you know, like I went to the EPA and I spoke in front of the EPA in Washington, D.C. on C-SPAN. And when it was all over with the Sierra Club guy comes by and I look at him, I said, so what did you think about my presentation? He's like, about what? (laughs) You know, all condescending. (laughs) About what? I said, about the clouds, about the fact that, you know, Clouds actually are the main, you don't know what I'm talking about? He's like, oh, that's just pure poppycock. (laughs) And I look at him, I I cannot, I'm not going to repeat what I said to him after that, that, but (laughs) to have some snide, pompous, lobbyist, prick, Ivy League idiot get owned by a guy with a high school diploma on (laughs) C-SPAN and then for him to call it poppycock and run away was just like the epicest epicness. <laughs> <laughs> that's no, that's great. Uh, you know, I, I, I would, I'd love to see, do you have a clip of that somewhere? <laughs> no, I mean, you got a, I got a clip of the hearing, you know, you could see it on my YouTube. Uh, it's youtube.com slash Jim Lee climate viewer. I finally got that straight. So youtube.com slash Jim Lee climate viewer, all one word. Right. Um, but you can see it on there. It'll say like world's first EPA hearing on, um, jet pollution or something like that. And what, what I did was these guys were going to regulate CO2 out of planes and methane and no- nitrous oxide and stuff like that because they were using the Clean Air Act. And I want to say this to make it clear to anybody who has any confu- confusion about what I was doing. They were trying to regulate six greenhouse gases because it was a quote, threat to human health under the Clean Air Act. And if you go and you read the Clean Air Act, it says, you know, any kind of pollution that is reasonably anticipated to, you know, kill people, (laughs) hurt people. And so I made my entire point that if you're concerned about things coming out of planes that could kill people, I'm, I, along with, all of my friends on the internet, we're main, we're mainly concerned about aluminum and barium. I just, I just want to throw that out there. Um, that, you know, that we're having a hearing about things that could affect human health and you guys are looking to regulate planes. So this is a 
public hearing and a finding so they you know to decide whether they should add additional things in and i went up there and said look you know i'm we're concerned about planes making clouds and we don't like lead aluminum and barium coming out of them furthermore you guys have not done enough testing to ensure that the public is safe that's what i went to do but to be a stinker I invited some friends. So I wanted to make sure that I could be wrong. This is just me being, being, being blunt. I could be wrong. You know what? Max Bliss could be 100% right, and I could be 100% wrong. Or Madison Star Moon, her version of it might be right on the money, and she made more of a better point than me. But regardless, the five of us each told a different version of the same story, that we're concerned about planes. We're not concerned about greenhouse gases. And you guys are up to some shenanigans. So it went beautifully. It was an epic win for this community because up to this point, there has never been really any public visibility like that, especially in that community. They've never really heard us, you know, argue our point directly to them. And did I go there expecting to change the world? Hell no. (laughs) I went there to make sure that our grievances were part of the public record, which will go in the national archive, which will be archived to the end of time. So that in 10 years from now, when this stuff actually gets all wrapped up and it's all done, people can go back and read my transcript and go, that dude knew what he was talking about. And we should have listened. <laughs> um, so no, that's look, why, that's yeah, why no, I, I did it, man. <laughs> no, I, I get it. And you wanted to, uh, to have that positive influence, even if it was just to, excuse me for using the term, plant the seeds that's so right. that later on it could germinate into a better understanding. I, I completely, uh, uh, empathize with exactly where you're coming from, you know, and, uh, of course I'm one of these guys who only has a high school diploma too. So, <laughs> You know, here we go. It seems as though uh, uh, some of us that are most concerned about presenting information to people aren't necessarily the Ivy League, academia, uh, you know, talking heads that you're supposed to listen to, the approved historians, the approved scientists, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, for the most part, these people, in my estimation, are often gatekeepers who – are meant to prevent us from being able to look at the whole of the possibilities, the reality as it stands, the historical record. Uh, somebody even mentioned in my chat room just now uh, a little bit ago that um, – that, that they found an instance referenced of weather, weather modification in 1880 or somewhere in there, uh, where they were putting explosives on balloons and sending them up into the sky. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know. he, he's, he's, he's a, off by a couple of years. Yes, I'm pulling this out of my head. I have my monitors turned off. Uh, General Dry Henceforth. <laughs> General Dry Henceforth was a guy down in Texas. And yes, he got government money. The government actually paid for this crap to go down there and blow up the sky. He put dynamite on balloons. He used cannons. He, he blew up the Texas sky for quite a while. (laughs) Well, they're they're saying it's a guy named General Ruggles, uh, would send explosives via via weather balloons. Uh, and it was patented, according to the, the chat room person. I, I I don't know how true that is. I've never I seen. Know, that. I know I know I know another one. It was down in Australia that was similar to this story, um, where the guy was also using cannons and balloons. And I think that that's the one he's actually referring to is the one that was down in Australia. Ah, uh, okay. But Check the point. Him. I mean, I'm, I'm pulling this out of my head. I haven't touched cloud seeding in like a year. But yeah, that's, it's on my, I've got a timeline and it's on there. I'm, sh- I'm sure of it. You can go to climateviewer.org slash geoengineering hyphen timeline. And I put all my references in there. It's a huge timeline. Well, right. And you know, we've, we've gone through a couple of general topics and believe it or not, we're just about up against the, uh, the, the first hour break, which, uh, by the way, they're saying it's General Daniel Ruggle. Uh, but, but anyway, I, I don't know. It must. I'm gonna, I'm gonna write that down just to make sure I've got it. I am, I, I, I'm like Johnny Five, man. I love input. If I have not heard of this guy, you're gonna make my day because I love reading new stuff. 
Exactly. I, that, and that's what I always say to people, too, is that, you know what, if you have new information, by all means, bring it to me. I will check it out and, and be more than happy to say, especially if it's something that I've said uh, that, that is in, you know, controversy with the new information. I'll be more than happy to say I was wrong or I needed to add this to my particular, oh, encyclopedia of knowledge that I carry in, well, what's left of my skull, right? Anyway, yeah. my guest tonight is Jim Lee. Of course, we're going to the break here, and we are talking about climateviewer.org and also climateviewer.com, geoengineering, uh, weather modification, all of these things. After all, let's boil it down to man-made clouds or artificial clouds, but I guarantee you we're going to get even deeper in the second hour, so stay tuned to American Freedom Radio, and we will be right back. No rules, no rules, no taboo topics, no taboo topics, no fear of doom, no fear of doom. We are, we are American Freedom Radio, American Freedom Radio. Okay, can we get quiet, please? Everybody sit down. Young man in the front row, spit that gum out. Thank you. Mm, cherry flavored. And now, the moment we've been waiting for. The man whom we all know and have grown to love over the years. Who won the Nobel Peace Prize for making the largest flavored jello shooter that the world has ever seen. And a great man of science who proved to us once and for all that no matter how much cherry flavored jello you put in your swimming pool, you still can't walk on water. I give to you Chuck O'Kelly! <laughs> There it is, the new second hour bumper. Thank you, Muddy, for that. I do appreciate it, man. <laughs> Little comic relief, which we gotta have every once in a while, uh, especially on this show. And we're talking about some pretty intense topics tonight. That's for sure. Meanwhile, let me remind you that, uh, if you do go to Ocelli, which is spelled O-C-H-E-L-L-I dot com, that is my website. I often forget to mention it. But uh, but it is available out there. Of course, uh, there are many archives there. There's a membership section, and anybody who does donate to me uh, ends up being named as an executive producer for the show that night or the next night that I do a broadcast, so on and so forth. Or if you become a member and that comes around, I do that as well. I'm going to come up with other ways to thank you guys uh, who have helped me uh, so much to keep this show going and to uh, to really keep my life in one piece as I go forward. Anyway, tonight we do have Jim Lee, and hey. it is amazing the information that we've gotten already. I'm going to ask one of the big questions that I ask just about any subject when I have them on for the first time, for sure, and I love the answers I get. One of my favorite ones was from Robbie Martin, where I asked him, you know, how is it that you got involved in all this? And he wound up telling us that story about creating a beheading video on the Internet as a joke and then getting a visit <laughs> from DHS. <laughs> you know, and I loved it. It was like, wow, how That's could you even, best. you, you couldn't make something like that up, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but, but Jim, you know, it, I, I, as I'm listening to you describe all this stuff and all these things that you become involved in, I mean, literally speaking, you're not just a guy who runs a website. You're an activist. Uh, you're an educator and, uh, and, and quite honestly, a, a really competent designer. Uh, there, there, there's many, many different titles we could give you, but let's talk about what actually got you interested in the subject or focused on it to begin with because you know you mentioned uh, the radiation right and this is one of the things that that I also have difficulty finding somebody to discuss the topic uh you know it, because radiation is one of these things that I think is uh well you know people talk about fukushima and people talk and and, and believe me that is not a good thing but they forget that we've already irradiated various parts of the planet, you know, through atmospheric testing, underground testing, all that. This, one way or another, is climate manipulation, geoengineering in one way or another, whether you want to understand it or not. The fact that we've done things like light off nuclear weapons in different places mm -hmm. for testing purposes. This has changed the landscape, too. Yeah. Um, but... 
you know that and and that by the way believe it or not it was the issue of nuclear war and the concept uh that was given to us in that that movie that was put out in uh 19, I think it was 1984 uh called the day after that got me writing a letter to president reagan when i was 12 years old and hmm. uh, and, and wound up uh, you know opening up my fbi file ever after apparently as a agree. subversive <laughs> No, and I found out it was true. Interesting story. I'll tell you about it off air sometime because I've told it on the air enough times. But I'm wondering what it is that got you. Uh, you know, let's just say you you could have been just a designer, a guy who was working with technology and making things like video games and uh, websites. I, I could very easily see that that could be your full time occupation, but. What is it that turned you into an activist and, uh, and, and somebody that was so focused on this particular area of study? <laughs> That's a great question. You're going to, you're going to trip. All right. So before I go any further, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that, um, I'm going to be at in Arizona on December 2nd through the 4th, um, in Phoenix, uh, at a conference held by G. Edward Griffin called Global Warming and Inconvenient Lie. And I will be giving a presentation in front of the Freedom Force International Third Congress, um, about geoengineering. And if you think you heard a lot tonight, I've got to squeeze all this into 45 minutes. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> that's good. You know, that's going to be tough and it's really cool. I've, I've had G. Edward Griffin on this show once. Um, and, uh, and, and I love the guy, of course, creature from Jekyll Island, Freedom Force International. These are, these are things that, you know, if you as a listener are not aware of, I don't know how you found my show. Uh, you, you got to be aware of this. And yes, Jim is speaking there. And, uh, hey, on this particular topic, coincidentally, huh? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. And that's, it's kind of why I've come out of my cave. Um, I tend to, I tend to, I'm, I'm, I was born in the year of the dragon and I know that about myself that I do, I do enjoy a certain a bit of being alone. Um, and it's just something about my character. So when I'm alone, I do a lot of thinking and that's, I don't know. That's, that's what I'll just, I'll leave it at that. I don't like to come out very often. And it's, um, on top of that, I have, um, and I don't tell a lot of people this, I have Graves disease. And Graves disease is a thyroid condition caused by heavy metals, something you mentioned at the very beginning, um, <laughs> of the show. And interestingly enough, you also mentioned Wi-Fi. And I believe that a combination of the two, crashed my um my thyroid so i developed hyperthyroid or graves disease and it makes it to where i don't really sleep very much um my heart would tend to stay around 100 to 120 beats a minute and to channel the two the wanting to be alone not being able to sleep and having all this extra energy that's that's why i've been able to do you know all of this stuff is because um if you've ever met a person who uses meth I'm like that normally. <laughs> like it's it's built into my system and I'm also um a native american and I I met an individual who basically told me that you know this isn't wi-fi or or radiation at all or any any of that. He says you were a warrior and your job was to stay up at night and protect the flock and protect the people and you could run faster than anybody. You could catch bison. And that's who you are. You're a warrior. And so is it, is it that I'm poisoned and I have a broken spirit and a broken thyroid or is this who I'm naturally supposed to be? I don't know. Um, but that's, 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 that's the real me underneath that I don't tell a lot of people about. And that drives a lot of what I, what I do. Um, but to how I got in this was I was at the Ronald McDonald house over in Columbia. <laughs> and uh my my nephew had a um a brain bleed and uh we were over there with the family mm. sitting in the lobby and i don't remember i could ask my wife real quick what the exact question was that started it all but somehow the illuminati came up and you know i tend to think that i know a lot about a lot of things and i really was coming up short <laughs> I was like, you know, I've heard of it. 
but I mean, it's like a secret society or something. And I was sitting there kind of going, you know, well, what, year, what year was this? By the this way? was in, I want to say 2010. Okay. This is before, this is pre Fukushima. Um, and you know, this is right about the time I, you know, became resonated shortly thereafter. Um, and I, and I said, to, I said to my wife, I was like, I really don't know that much about the Illuminati. <laughs> and I, and I it just did a completely honest moment. <laughs> I, I don't remember it exactly. Your, your memory tends to exaggerate things, but in my exaggerated memory, these two kids look up from their cell phone and the one of them goes, you don't know what the Illuminati is. <laughs> and I mean, these are like teenagers and I felt kind of stupid. And then I had to, you know, go home and look it up. And boy, did that start a fire. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I started looking that up and, you know, I graduated from only talking about secret societies as a secret individual to having my name out in public and mapping things. So now we'll get to the second stage of how I got to be here. I went on the Google Earth forums and I had made my very first version of the map. I did not know how to program a website at this time. And I was using Google Earth and I had mapped, you know, all of the ionospheric heaters, the super darn radars, some missile defense radars and, you know, some weather modification things you know, like weather modification projects like cloud seeding projects and things like that around the world. And I put it up on the Google form. I was super proud. I was like, I got nuclear reactors. I got NSA facilities. <laughs> I got drones all over America and I've got weather modification. And the moderators took my file out of the cool section and put it into the other sentient side. And I was offended to say the least. No, no, and wait, 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 wait a second, wait a second. The cool section to the other sentient side can, w w I, I'm, I'm not drawing a, a good okay, reference. So what they're, does that mean? They're in, in, in the Google Earth forums, um, the GEC, as they call it, the Google Earth community, people post their maps that they create. So I mapped out where I went hiking this weekend, and here's the trail and the pictures I took along it. You can see it in Google Earth. Okay. Share the file on a forum. And they have like, you know, the science section or the reference section or the military section. And I put it in one of those kind of sections. They put it in the UFO sighting section. Oh, OK. So what what you're saying is like somebody else might have uh, put a map up and said, here's U.S. installations in uh, 170 out of 190 countries uh, across the world. And here's where they are. And they put little marks on the on the globe. Let's yeah, just say map it out. Yeah, and they so that's it it's a community of people who map things out. And I got okay. into it really quickly. I just thought it was fun, you know, going to the Google Earth and searching, you know, through, ah, oh, I see it. There's a radar. There's the other ionospheric heater. Nobody has ever found this ever. I'm the first person on the planet to ever actually put this on a map and put it out to where people know the name of it, who made it. There's their website. There's their phone number. There's the power, how many antennas, all that. Boom. Put it up there and they, they mock it. It was a slap in the face, you know. Like, I'm going, you know, bitch, I'm fabulous. You should be applauding. And you put me in the, in the tinfoil hat section. What the F? Uh, and um, okay. they were like, they were like, well, weather modification is not real. And that will be the comment heard around the world. Because at the time in 2010, and you can go Google it, there really wasn't any of the stuff that you're reading about today. And I had to work my butt off. To get most of this stuff out here. I mean, the lists of patents, the lists of companies, the, the, the exhaustive amount of work I put into it has really fruited a, ver a fervent discussion that I know I seeded because when I started, there was none of this stuff. And it's not because I couldn't find it because I've always, I'm an, I also am an IT guy. I was a network administrator. I'm self-taught everything I just described to you. I've not been to school. I just, I'm pretty gifted and I can learn anything. I remember everything I read. So I taught myself to repair computers, build networks, do VPNs. Um, I ran a five company, you know, five building network for a tire company for like four years. 
and um, never had an issue. I, I stopped Chinese hackers and Russian hackers. It was amazing. Um, that's when I became a member of Anonymous. And um, anyway, so <laughs> I just said too much. <laughs> um, so needless to say, I know my way around a computer pretty darn well. And, um, you know, I, I just set about, um, you know, putting this information out there in a way that I thought would at least, you know, vilify myself. How dare you tell me this is not real when I see this is not a conspiracy. This is history that is not well known. And I have fought tooth and nail since that day to keep people grounded in reality. Like my website, ha- I have all the respect in the world right now in this community because I have never swavered, you know, swerved on the fact that I want this to be accurate and I want it to be truthful. And I mean, the debunkers at Metabunk, Mick West, I defeated them years ago. These guys won't even mess with me. They call me on the phone. Um, the guys on Facebook, Kaku, they troll everybody. They hurt the hell out of people. They're a cyber harassment team. They're scared of me. I challenged all of them to a debate. I said, pick your best, smartest PhD guy group in the group. I'll debate you live any format. Harassed them for six months. They finally just, they hide from me. So I know that I'm now in a position where I can feel comfortable that what I'm saying is true. And I'm going to do more to spread that message because up to this point, I've been reticent to go out and say all this stuff because I don't want to be wrong. (laughs) You know what I mean? Nobody wants to be wrong. And more importantly, I don't want to be part of the problem. I don't want to be one of those guys going out there saying all this stuff that I'm just saying it for, you know, personal gain or because I want to inflate my ego or build my subscribership. Yes, I want to build my subscribership because I want people to resonate the truth. If if what I'm saying is resonating with you, then I'm doing my job because you you know it to be true because it rings true, and then you verified it. And you didn't trust me. You knew your gut that I was telling you the truth, and you got bullshitted before. But now you're gonna you put your big boy pants on and realize that before what you were doing was entertainment, and you were enjoying entertainment, and now you've met an activist who's giving you all of the information. Names, addresses, why they did it, where they do it, all that. You have a choice to make. Do you want to do something about it or do you enjoy entertainment? Mm -hmm. Or are you addicted to fear porn? Are you addicted to fear that you were previously getting from other people? And when I come over here showing you the names, addresses, phone numbers, that's to empower you so that you're not you're not fearful anymore. That's so that you can do something about it. Because me, I'm poor. I I don't have the funds to fly and set up conferences or fly up to D.C. I don't even have the money to go up on the train. So my best way to serve and make up for a lot of the wrong things I've done in my life is part of it. But my best way to serve this mission, to get the truth out there about this very divisive topic, which is full, filled with a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, which is interjected by people with big egos or making money on it, um, that mm. I'm going to rise above that somehow, that I'm, that even though I'm poor, <laughs> I'm going to stick to my guns and, and rise above that. And the truth will get out there no matter what on this particular topic. And before I was trying to shoot too much, I talked about Fukushima. You brought up radiation. I was talking about Fukushima. I was talking about slave speak. I was talking about Wi-Fi. I was talking about the New World Order and surveillance. And I realized that though I know a lot about each of these, I know about Oscan Succus and the Five Eyes and how the New World Order was formed in the British-UK agreement and the Signals Intelligence Agreements and the ABCA army and the, you know, all of that stuff, Anglo sphere. I know it all, mm-hmm. but I know just enough about that to be dangerous. I can tell you about the stone ghost network. You know, it actually has a real name and Israel gets all the info off of it. Scott free, you know, so everything that the five eyes collects goes to stone ghost. It goes to Israel. I knew all this before um, Snowden said it. You can check the, the Google and see that I had NSA facilities and all this stuff. Said Oz, Kanzakis, Five Eyes, long before Snowden. And I sent it to Glenn Greenwald. I sent it to InfoWars. I said, look at my Climate Viewer 3D map. I've got in it every all these NSA facilities. I've got the drones in America, the underwater cables. Look at this stuff. 
And you know what I got? Crickets. Well, see, now you've actually struck upon why it is that I wanted you on here, because I got to hear about your attitude and I got to hear from you a little bit. And I also got to look at some of your work. And to be quite honest with you, the reason why I do the radio show is because, yes, I know just enough about a lot of subjects to be dangerous. I want to bring on people who know this stuff backwards and forwards in their sleep to educate me and the listener at the same time. This is my contribution, is to try and distribute it, right? The, right. The, this is my part of it because I, I think I, I'm, I'm just clever enough, not necessarily a great talk show guy, but I'm just clever enough to break things down and to ask some questions that provoke the kind of conversation that really educates people if they just listen. Mm. Okay, that's why I do it. And that's exactly, and, and this is, I knew you were coming from this place. And uh, I talked to other people about you and got their impressions about you, uh, so on and so forth. The truth is, I knew about these maps and things, didn't know who was behind them <laughs> for years. Uh, I've heard stories about uh, a lot of the stuff that you've touched on. But, yeah, we, we could sit here and talk about secret societies. We could talk about uh, the literal, you know, what, what people might describe as black magic rituals that go into certain things. Oh, don't get me started on spirit cooking. That is the greatest birthday present I ever received. Uh, <laughs> my birthday was November 4th. Spirit cooking happened that day and a whole bunch of other things. It just was like the best damn birthday ever. Um, <laughs> but let's not go there. <laughs> no, 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 let's no. leave that alone. No, we're not going to go there. But what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, I, I describe to people when I do have a base of knowledge. But otherwise, the show's not about me. I'd rather have somebody else on who has dedicated themselves to it. And I find it interesting that, uh, you know, first of all, it was a challenge for you. But secondly, the fact that disease plays a role here, because I feel as though, and here we go again with my opinion based on all these things coming together, when we examine the, uh, you know, the manipulation of the food, the manipulation of what they call medicine, the manipulation of the air, the manipulation of weather, the manipulation of the climate, the manipulation of the psychology, the manipulation directly in one way or another of water. It seems as though any single thing that goes into the human existence, anything that is part of sustaining us as a species is being simultaneously attacked. Now, I describe it this way all the time. And I can back up a lot of what I'm saying, but I would much rather bring somebody on who tells me about thimerosal, who tells me about ethyl mercury, who tells me about yeah. what's actually been uh, sampled from the alleged trails, the clouds, whatever. When when I when I have someone on who tells me about these things because they went out and did the surveys in the ocean and realized that plankton is dying and here's the different factors that seem to be going into it. When they tell me that the food chain has been interrupted in different places and that weather is changing in a different way than what they told us to begin with. See even when I was in high school, I remember doing this uh, uh, project where they were talking about, remember the hole in the ozone layer, Jim? Yep. Okay. That was the big deal, right? That was right. a huge deal. And the reason why was because of these tetrafluorocarbons, what they call Oh, them. yeah. Ooh. Okay. Now, it was fascinating, and they were just introducing this into the curriculum in the northeast of, of, of you know, the alleged United States of America. Anyway, uh, this was going on. And I said, okay, let me research this. And I found that before these carbons were in such high concentration that other holes in the ozone had been observed and had been observed repairing themselves, mm -hmm. which to mm -hmm. me meant that it would at the very least cast doubt on the idea that your air conditioners and your automobiles are doing this if in a lower concentration the same thing had happened 40 years earlier. You know right. what else? You know what else destroys ozone? Tell me. Uh, artificial radiation belt remediation. So Ooh. HARP, and this is something nobody tells you about HARP. HARP is about sucking radiation out of space and dumping it on the North Pole. Did you know that? That's uh, the main purpose. That's why they got the funding to do it. 
That's how they, why they created HARP was to modify the ionosphere in a way that allows them to vacuum radiation out of space and dump it on the North Pole and the South Pole. Do you believe me? Uh, that sounds like an assertion I've never actually heard before. Jim. Exactly. And the reason why my stuff is unique is because I use slave speak to do my research. When I do my research, I don't rely on anybody who uses too much slave speak because they are full of crap. So all of the stuff that's on climateviewer.com is flavored with a guy who has used the goggles of slave speak to try to find the truth. And the truth is mountains of references on climateviewer.com slash harp, H-A-A-R-P. Um, if you go to climateviewer.com slash harp, you can see everything I'm about to tell you. This radiation belt remediation is about sucking radiation out of the sky to prevent things like nuclear detonation in space, which they call high altitude electromagnetic pulse. If anybody's ever heard of impact, it's the group that's trying to protect our infrastructure worldwide from an EMP detonation, which would kill two thirds of Americans in six months if we had a nationwide power outage. Mm. Um, HARP was actually got the funding from a guy named Dennis Papadopoulos from the University of Maryland who had this HARP tether program panel where they, they spoke. You can see the references, the Eisenhower Institute, and they said use HARP as a wind tunnel for a mitigation system against EMP. And they're talking about not just, you know, Iran putting off EMP. Everybody talks about nuclear bombs all the time, nuclear wars. Ooh, Iran has had an EMP for a very long time. So has North Korea. And EMPs are way more dangerous than nuclear bombs. Um, And most people don't know that. You can detonate one EMP centralized over America and knock out the entire power worldwide or uh, continent-wide. And the Heritage Foundation said that two-thirds of Americans would die. So that's pretty serious. (laughs) Um, Yeah. (laughs) that, That is what you see in the television show Revolution. So what you see in the television show Revolution, HARP, originally got its funding to prevent that. So I kind of love hate this thing because on the one hand, if we had another Carrington event and a huge solar, you know, bolt was coming our way, it would fry the planet. We'd all have some serious health issues and everybody probably die from killing each other because they have no burgers and fries and football. Mm. So that's the (laughs) truth about HARP. At the nutshell level, if you take that and you just throw it out, then you can hate it for causing earthquakes and for, you know, all the other things that we talk about. And I can prove, you know, doing underground tomography with um, HARP, they use it to do sounding for nuclear um, bombs underneath Iran. So you pass a massive um, low frequency wave through the earth. Not just around the earth. I'm talking about through the earth, through the underside of the earth. Right. And then you catch it with something called LOFAR, which is the low frequency array. It covers all of Europe. And the two of them, HARP and LOFAR, is called HALO. And HALO is an underground sensing dream come true for these guys. And what they do is they pass a massive amounts of elf waves. These are very low frequency waves. They pass through bone and stone as I like to say. So these waves can endure through the stone and they can listen for the, the ripples and the voids in the ground and they can see caves underground, model them in 3D, see where North Korea is hiding their nukes. Problem is you can also cause earthquakes doing that. And there are many, many reference for that, you know, that if you pass massive amounts of electricity, you know, electromagnetic waves through these rock structures and you jar loose something that was set in stone that there might be some slippage and it caused earthquakes it's kind of a no-brainer but it gets a little weirder so then we have the fukushima event so i'm gonna tie a bow on harp and (laughs) fukushima because you were talking about radiation well Um, because it's part of see here's the thing it's all part of the equation jim that this different subjects some people might think that we're dancing between different subjects but it's all interrelated. They it's are all, all interrelated. And, yeah. and, and that's what Climate Viewer 3D, I swear to God, the reason why I designed it was really for two points. One was to create a verification system for weather modifications. So we catch them in the act. Um, but it's also to see the correlations that you can't see otherwise. 
to to overlay different data sets and say, look, if I put this one on and I put this layer on, they're related. You see that? That wherever there's fracking, there's drought and cloud seeding. Huh. Mm-hmm. I never thought about that. Why is all of the cloud seeding projects in America in locations that have droughts and those locations are the only places that have fracking wells? Well, it turns out fracking uses billions of gallons of water. <laughs> and because they're using up all the water and pumping out radioactive sludge everywhere, they have to now pay for cloud seeding so they can get more water back. And that's what they do, whether it works or not, whether it's causing floods, they don't care because it's causing floods right now. In October, all of the cloud seeding stations in the Rocky Mountains turn on. You can see those cloud seeding stations on climateviewer.org slash 3D. And I can show you the NOAA reports are also on there. So you have to report to the government when you modify the weather. I've got the reports from 2002 to 2012 mapped out in 3D. And you can see that all on the Rocky Mountains, they operate from October to about March. And right now, this moment, while we're talking, there's a blizzard headed towards the east. And that blizzard is artificially nucleated, as they like to say in the in the this world, artificially artificially nucleated snow. It's so stupid. I, I, the terms that these people come up with just piss me off. But mm. the, it is an artificially altered storm. So they are cloud seeding in the Rocky Mountains. Those the silver iodide that they use in the orographic cloud seeding, um, they, they put them on the west side of the mountains. And the wind comes up to the Rockies, and as it travels up over the Rockies, it carries the silver iodide and other poisons. There's a whole lot of stuff. They don't just use silver iodide. I don't want to get started because I don't want to go through the long list, but silver iodide, uh, CO2, urea. Urea is fertilizer. You know they cloud seed with fertilizer? Don't get me started. Um but on the west side of the mountains, they, they have silver iodide generators. These were invented by a guy named Irving P. Crick. Now, you guys might have seen the video, um, Disney and their steering hurricanes, like 1959, Walt Disney steering hurricanes in the future. And it's like widely shared. Everybody's got it on their YouTube channel. So you've probably seen it by now. And they show like satellites predicting the weather and they're using rockets and they're shooting rockets into a a hurricane and they're going to steer it around. And this is what makes me different than everybody else who watched that video. I went, who was the guy who came up with this idea? And I looked at the credits and I saw technical advisor Irving P. Crick. I was like, who's this guy? (laughs) <laughs> and I had been doing, I'd been doing this like three years, you know, and I had thought I had everything in my, in my timeline. And I looked up Irving P. Crick and it turns out he's the guy. He advised Disney on this film that everybody's sharing. He's the guy that invented the ground based cloud seeder. And I thought that was fascinating. So then I looked him up and I read all the stuff and then I started seeing all the historical photos, put them in my timeline and all that. And then I met his son on Facebook. <laughs> He's like, you know, you're the only guy on the entire Internet that ever mentioned my dad. <laughs> so wow. I know, I know that, you know, you guys can talk your smack about who's the baddest guy on the planet when it comes to geoengineering. You're, you're talking to him, right? You're listening to him right now. You need to check my research. It's unique. Nobody's ever went there. But anyway, back to the story. Irving P. Crick, this dude, he invented the cloud, ground-based cloud seeder in 1949, I want to say. It's, it's all my timeline. Um, and by, uh, three years later, they were all from the top of the, the Rockies to the, to the southern tip. They were spread all over America. To this day, since 1949, they've been operational. Most people do not know this stuff. And it wasn't until because I tried this three years ago. I tried to map out these ground-based cloud seeders, but there was no information. I mean, you could not I, – I found like two, you know, maps that were like hand-drawn and they'd scanned in, you know, of where some seeding stations were, but it just wasn't on the Internet. You know what I mean? And, you know, I and luckily I've revisited it and I've found most of them and I've mapped them out on Climate Viewer 3D. But what I'm already starting to see – 
is that when you go turn them all on, that's a lot of cedars. It is an unbelievably large amount of cedars. And when we've got a blizzard coming right now, and we know that they're operational from October to March every year, this is stuff people need to know because here's where I see problems. Um, if the guys in, in the, the eastern states figure out that what I'm telling them is true, that the guys in the western states who are fracking and cloud seeding on a daily basis are causing the billions of dollars of damage over on the east coast, they're done. They're through. Wow. Hang it up, write it up. You're going to jail. You're probably going to be sued out of oblivion. And I, and, and here's the sad part about it. I watched this uh, documentary called Owning the Weather. It's on uh, Hulu. It's actually excellent. Um, and they actually interview a lot of the guys who do this stuff. And, you know, it's great to demonize people. It's great to say these evil MFers that are modifying the weather. But at the end of the day, they got kids. You know what I mean? They're people too. And they ha- they interviewed, I think his name was Tom Shearer. I want to say that's his name. And he was the, the head of the Texas Weather Modification Association. And he literally, Almost with a tear in his eye, he's like, you know, people want to say all this stuff about us, but, you know, you know why I do this? Because my daddy did it. And you know why my daddy did it? Because farmers need rain. And we feed America. And we do need that rain. And I do this for free. We don't make any money doing this. And that's when it really hit me in the gut, you know? That we hear a lot of propaganda online, just like this Hillary Clinton Trump thing. And we're guilty too. And you mentioned him earlier, but guys like Dane Wigington who just vilify and demonize and just, it's, it's like the all out assault on, you know, it's, it's so fear porn. It's so, that, that's what we got from this election. Is it a perfect display of what we saw in V for Vendetta mixed with a horror show? People demonizing individuals, not seeing them as human, and now we've got violence across America from triggered liberals. That, that's well, what we've got in that's what we've got in the geoengineering and chemtrail world. We have people that scare the shit out of people on a daily basis. And give them no solution whatsoever. So before we go any further, I want to talk about a real solution. Well, Jim, before, a- before you yeah. do that, because, because here's the thing. I think that, uh, and, and I'm guilty of being angered by the fact that this stuff is going on. Uh, it, it's, it's horrendous to me to think that Again, you know, just like with the genetically modified organisms in the food, I think that people do not understand the damage that they're doing. And I can't see how one can participate in that and sleep well at night. Okay, fine. You know, my my daddy did it and we want to give rain to the farmers. I got it. But at the expense of who does any, you know, you know what I'm saying? It, it It's it's too much. I mean, for me, not day, to be though, angry at though. It, you can be angry. Anger, anger is 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 a powerful emotion, and if it is used for good, it can be a good thing. But if your anger is just generally misplaced, or if if your your, your anger causes another fear, then you've actually done more harm to our cause than help, because people who are demoralized cannot be effective at anything. And the, that Brzezinski guy talking about America and the, the four steps of the end of America. And we're in the third step, demoralization. And the everybody's demoralized. They believe they cannot do it. They believe the government does not work. Nothing we will do will, will work. They won't listen anyway. When I went to the EPA, I was threatened, mocked, and intimidated, laughed at, told that this is all stupid. They're not going to listen anyway. The government doesn't work. Um, you know, the, the, the competition <laughs> said that it was a disinformation event, all that stuff. Right. So that's just the, that's the, that's the game that these guys are playing. And well, I, I don't believe in, look, I don't believe in surrender. Okay. I don't um, either. I believe that we need to find solutions 
and we need to address these issues. They are dangerous issues in a lot of cases. I do believe that the government is not working in its present form. I do believe that there's a lot of problems like that that we need to address in many, many ways. It's going to take a lot of us. It's not going to be something I'm going to be do by, able to do by myself. We're, th- this is why I want this information out there. This is why I do this. To be honest with you, if I thought that there was no chance of changing anything, why would I bother doing this show? What? So I could just upset other people. They see that, that I never understood either. And believe me, I am not somebody who uh, gets on board with the fear porn industry. I can't stand those people. I really can't. And and at the end of the day, they turn around and what do they want to do? They want to profit off of it one way or another, whether it's the profits of ego or it's financial compensation or whatever. That's what it's about. And that's not where my head is. But it doesn't mean that I'm not going to get angry about some of this stuff because I I see it as as irresponsible. Well, OK, you know, I like to say that, you know, if if you're going to be angry about something, at least do something with it. And, you know, for me. I spent my formative years in high school and all that fighting and being angry. And I sung in a metal band. I sang Pantera on a stage and got in a hundred fights. I mean, I was just violent. You know what I mean? I had a violent childhood. <laughs> so, so me, me too, me I, too, I by the way, I was, a, I was a correction officer. I understand anger, but I, it's I, got, I was a, it has got yeah. me nothing but pain. And I'm telling you this as a, from a personal standpoint that I have finally reached a point in my life where I know that every time I get anger, angry, I need to change that into something useful and, 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 and recognize that I can control myself. I can't control the world, but I can, I can control myself. And that's the heart of mind control guys. That if you allow someone to say you are the N word, then you and you come unglued and you do what these liberals are doing in the street and you get triggered because of words, then you are mind controlled, that you are owned, that you are a slave and that is slave speak. If you allow someone else's words to make you do something, to dance for them, if I can call you an in and you dance, I control you. Why can't the world get that right now, Chuck? Why can't they understand that sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me, and that you cannot have a conversation with someone who does not think like you because you might be labeled this? or It doesn't make sense to me. I will talk to anybody, whether I disagree with them or not. Um, Dane Wigginson, perfect example. We don't agree about global warming, but I have tried repeatedly to just try to you know, see what we can agree on. And, and and benefit the community. But I get nothing but pushback from most people. And I'm not going to single him out. You know what I mean? I get, I get pushback because I say that I believe that most of this is a chemical reaction. It's caused by fuel, and the fuel is bad. The fuel has the aluminum, the barium in it. I can prove it in a court of law uh, that this is history repeating itself. We had chemtrails in 72. They, were, they got sued. The aviation industry got sued for chemtrails in 1972. To prove it. I can prove it in a court of law. Right. So this is history repeating itself. And they they hate me for it. But at the end of the day, we all agree geoengineering is a bad thing. We don't like people modifying the weather. Why can't we why can't we work together on that? That's what everybody says to me on a daily basis. Why can't you guys work together on that? And I say to them all the same thing. I know that nobody reads my website. <laughs> but um for the past like four years, I've had the same solution, and I call it the clarity clause. Okay. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background, and just it's two simple points. I want transparency and verification. And this, I think that everybody listening, if you've heard of geoengineering, chemtrails, or HARP, you're going to agree with me that what, and even, I've even had Stephen Salter, he's a geoengineer, agree with me that this is a good idea. Mm-hmm. That in 1978, there was a law called NMOD, and it was a ban on weather warfare passed. And NMOD is the Environmental Modification Treaty. It came about because the United States military did weather warfare over Vietnam. And Correct. we were cloud seeding over the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We were attempting to make it so muddy that we impeded the, the enemy that they couldn't get their little ox carts full of hand grenades down the dirt road. So we modified the weather over Vietnam. The problem is they didn't tell anybody. 
And then a guy, you can't make this stuff up, a guy walks in the president's office and he sees a piece of paper on the desk of the president that says the words Operation Popeye. Right. That's how we found out. I mean, and, and most people, even in this audience who've heard all this stuff, probably don't know this stuff. I mean, it's amazing to me that people don't know about NMOD and Popeye. Um, but Operation Popeye, as a result of it, there's another paper that came out in 1978, uh, Weather Modification Problems, Policies, and Potential. And the entire chemtrail community passed this paper around going, look, it's confirmation of chemtrails in 1978. We told you so. And I'm going, none of y'all read that thing. <laughs> if you read it, you'd know. That here's the here's the truth. In 1972 or um, 1978, we had already had a hearing. I think the hearing was 1976. They had a hearing. They got the top brass from all the military, brought them in front of Congress and said, you know, what the F? You know, you guys were modifying the weather in war over Vietnam. And the top brass under oath lied. You can read this on climateviewer.com. Just type in NMOD in the search and you're going to see the article about it. And I got a bunch of inside dirt from a website called sunshineproject.org, which has been deleted from the Internet, which I found on archive.org, and I copy-pasted every bit of it back on the Internet. Um, And you can read that the general said, I do not even wish to admit, sir, that such programs existed. So they, I mean, all the way to the very end, after doing weather warfare, lied to Congress and still got busted. And the UN had the NMOD law passing, no more weather warfare worldwide. And in 1978, that paper that everybody's calling the chemtrail, you know, confirmation is a, for the first time, the government going, we need to know about every single weather modification project that is either federally funded or privately funded, get some numbers, how much it costs, where it's going on. They did a full report. That report is that report. The reason that report was made was because they just had their ass handed to them in front of Congress and a law passed saying you can never modify the weather for war again. And the government wanted to know, okay, now we want to know who all is modifying, who's owning the weather. And if people just knew that, instead of everybody passing it around going, it's a chemtrail confirmation, I feel so stupid. You know, I, I, I had that paper on my timeline. So some jerk went to my timeline, read that paper, and then turned it into a conspiracy and shared it everywhere. And it got a lot of visibility. People, you know, heard about the paper, but they were misled as to the purpose of it. They don't know the history of it or the context. And that's where I come in. The reason you even heard about it in the first place because me, and now I'm on Chuck's show telling you the truth. And hopefully you guys will resonate that so that we can understand the real history of this and prevent it from repeating itself. Well, it is repeating itself. So here's the well, thing. Let me, let me ask you something about that real quick though, because we do have about 10 minutes left and I want to make sure I get this in. Um, fact is though that simply because the government memorialized this, uh, doesn't that in a way, actually confirm the idea that they knew about it at least that far back because they wouldn't be asking questions. See, it's an interesting thing when you look at, like, say, the Rockefeller Commission and uh, stuff like this when it comes to, uh, you know, assassination squads and things being run by the CIA, which, uh, you know, and so on and so forth, right? And a lot of people point to it and say, see, that's confirmation. And I say, no, this is actually the government finally questioning part of what was happening. Um, yeah. Now, now, is that a way of, by extension, confirming it? Because if there was nothing to question, the question wouldn't be asked, you know. Uh, confirming what? Well, confirming that, you know, the government had to have known something about it in about order to it, begin to ask questions. It, it is a high-level descriptor, Chuck. What is it? I'm sorry. Uh, had to know something about weather warfare. Yes, okay. the government did know about it. The top-level brass lied to the politicians all the way up to the end. And then because of – oh, and by the way, that, Congre- that that congressional hearing is still classified to this day. Mm. And I'm going to make sure that, that thing comes unglued one day because I want to read what was set up in there. But that's a FOIA that's at the top of my list. 
is the congressional hearing for that where the top brass lied. I want everybody in public to know it. And we yes. will get that one day. But what I'm putting forward as a, as a serious solution to everything we're talking about in back in around 58, they banned upper atmospheric nuclear explosions. They said no more nukes in the sky because there would have been 2053 nuclear explosions worldwide. Our grandparents breathed all that. You can see all 2053 of those nuclear explosions on Climate Viewer 3D, climateviewer.org. Um, the, the thing about it is when they banned them in 58, it wasn't until 1994. Now, between all that, the military was trying to detect nuclear explosions to make sure that people actually weren't doing it. Um, but they didn't have a system. And then in 1994 with the STAR program, they actually made a system of infrasound recorders worldwide to verify when nuclear explosions happen and triangulate them so we know exactly where they happen. So from 58 to 94, they said, don't do it in 58. In 1994, they could say, we know when they did it and verify it. With NMOD in 78, they said, no more weather warfare. Now, we all agree that that's a good idea. The problem is... In 2015, Jane Seidel, who's from NOAA, spoke at the Weather Modification Conference, links on climateviewer.com, video of her saying this on my YouTube channel. We cannot detect rogue geoengineering. Another article I wrote, climate inter, um, climate warfare, the CIA and climate terror. I can't think of the name of it right now. I'm having a drone or fart. But anyway, um, Alan Robot got a call from the CIA. And Alan Robach is a geoengineer. And Alan Robach said the CIA said if the government, another government was modifying the weather over America or geoengineering, could we tell? And Alan Robach said, I'm pretty sure we could. And this made headlines everywhere. CIA calls geoengineer to ask if could we tell if somebody from another country was modifying our weather. And Jane Seidel at that weather modification conference, January 2015, said, no, we cannot. Our sensors are not good enough to tell when somebody's modifying the weather for cloud seeding purposes or for geoengineering purposes. And the reason that she said is that natural variability would override our ability to, to detect um, a change. So basically, in a nature, galactic cosmic rays, a solar flare, any one of those things could create clouds today. Or Russia could create clouds today. We don't know the difference at all. Wow. Wow. So if that's the case, then 1978, the law they said, weather modification, warfare, warfare purposes are long lasting effects is what the, the key part of the law, long lasting effects. Geoengineering, pretty long lasting effects. Um, we have no way to detect that. So my simple solution, and I'm preaching it from now on, I'm going to really, I, I said, I spoke about a lot of things. I'm focused on this topic from now on until something is done about it. The, the solution is to make them verify in mod. There's a law in the books that says you can't modify the weather for warfare purposes. There is no protection against cloud seeders causing a storm that washes your house away. There have been thousands of litigations against people who modify the weather. But the law clearly states no weather warfare, and there's no way to verify it. So I'm asking for two things, transparency and verification. Transparency, I want anybody who dumps a chemical in the sky or otherwise experiments in our atmosphere to give a 48-hour notice on a publicly available website so that if there is loss of life, limb, or property, you're held accountable. And that should be an international law. So that maybe the World Meteorological Organization's expert team on weather modification, Rolf, get off your ass and make this happen. Because they could easily, they, they, they it's all reported to them anyway. They stopped re- publishing their reports in 2007. I want to see that be real time, 48 hours in advance. Anybody who wants to modify the weather, and if you're caught, the fines and penalties should be so excruciating, nobody would ever try. The second part of that is verification. Now, I've already built Climate Viewer 3D. That's why I built it, was for verification. The problem is right now we're relying on government sensors. Uh. So my solution is something similar to Weather Underground, 
where you can buy a unit, you put it in your backyard, and it tells you what the local weather is in your backyard, and you upload that to a map where everybody in the world can see it. But I want to build a system that has radiation detection, nanoparticulate detection, and real-time analysis. And I understand that technology has to come some part of the way to meet me in the middle before I can make this a reality. But with some government backing and some people who actually cared, this could be made um, possible because RADnet shut itself off during Fukushima. Do you want to trust them to tell you the next time? I want to build a system that can verify, you know, if somebody's modifying the weather, if somebody's dumping chemicals, we have real-time aerosol chemical detection worldwide. And that anybody who puts anything in the sky will instantaneously know. The other problem with that is that it has to be done at altitude as well. And I've been speaking with a guy from Brazil who owns a drone company that flies over coal factories and tests their particulates. This is your industry. So between, you know, automated drones that all they do is sniff, I mean, a network sensor. It's called the Clarity Clause. It's on climateviewer.org slash geoengineering. It's my draft legislation to solve this problem, and I hope you guys will support it and resonate it. If you think you can come up with a better idea, tell me. Absolutely, and tell people once again uh, about the conference for G. Edward Griffin, Freedom Force International, that you're going to be at in Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah, and I will be presenting geoengineering research in uh, Phoenix, Arizona on December 2nd through 4th. If you want to get tickets and show up and meet me, I will be there, and I will be there through the weekend. So Sunday, we're not doing anything. I'll be talking with the public. Anybody wants to hang out. Um, and furthermore, I didn't mention it, climate, or gofundme.com slash climate viewer, gofundme.com slash climate viewer. If you want to support the app, um, I don't have ads on any of my material um, and I do it all for free and for the love of it. That's the only way I get support currently. So if you'd like to support my work, um, hit me up on GoFundMe.com slash climate. This is American Freedom Radio. Freedom, freedom, American Freedom Radio. Radio. American Freedom Radio.